John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, so stop right there, the Jews, the Sabbath is their Saturday. Is the Saturday, our, our labeled Saturday, is their Sabbath, okay? So that's their last day of the week, their day of rest. So now the first day of the week, our Sunday, today, Jesus is going to come back from the dead. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. So this morning, when some of you were sleeping and a few of you insomniacs were awake, Jesus um, was going to be visited, theoretically, by Mary Magdalene in the tomb. And Mary saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb! And we don't know where they've laid him! So, Mary shows up to the tomb. Jesus has been jacked out of the tomb. He needed like a low jack or whatever inside of his burial cloth because somebody, Mary thinks, has rolled the stone away, taken Jesus' dead body, schlepped it over his shoulder, and taken Jesus somewhere else. And here's the reason I say that. Because people don't come back from the dead. So Mary rightly thinks somebody took Jesus' body. I love the authenticity of this passage. Because when you show up to the tomb, you don't go, oh, he's, he must be alive somewhere. Maybe he's at Dairy Queen, maybe he's hanging out at In-N-Out. Blah, blah. You, you automatically think dead people don't come back to life, or if you're a Night of the Living Dead fan or whatever, they don't walk like zombies around. So Mary rightly thinks somebody stole Jesus' body. I can't believe this happened. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there that Jesus would have been buried in, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen cloths, but folded up in a place neatly by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So nobody's seen Jesus yet. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look inside the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, one at the head and one at the foot of where Jesus had been laid. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord. Then I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? What kind of question is that? I love Jesus. He's back from the dead, and he still has a sense of humor. <laughs> He's hanging out. The Mary, Mary's probably crying her eyes out, thinking that Jesus' body has been stolen. She came to honor Jesus' body, and now somebody stole it for some unknown reason. Jesus is inside the tomb, and he talks to her. So, uh, why are you crying? Like, we're just going to have a conversation here. We're just going to hang out. So, it's kind of weird that we're all in the tomb together. Why are you crying? Why are you crying, Jesus? Wow. Really? At this time? Yeah. Woman, why are you crying? I love Jesus. You're standing at a little tomb. So who are you seeking? <laughs> who are you looking for, Mary? You know, they're in like a 10 by 12 foot stone room. So who are we looking for today? See, Jesus is awesome. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord! And that he had said these things to her. Verse 19. On the evening of that day, so Sunday night, tonight when you go eat dinner, tonight in the evening, the first day of the week, 
the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So the disciples are scared for their lives. They've actually locked the door, assuming that they now are going to die just like Jesus. So they say, hey, Peter, make sure that door's locked because we're probably going to get arrested. Doesn't sound like guys that had a lot of confidence Jesus was coming back from the dead when you locked the door for a meal. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Shalom, peace. And that's the, that's the Hebrew way, the Hebrew word and the Hebrew way of saying, may you have peace inside and outside. May your external factors be at peace. May your internal heart be at peace. Verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The most understated verse in the whole Bible. They thought they were going to die. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up and it says, I love how the verse just kind of goes, and then they were glad they saw Jesus. <laughs> Not like a long lost friend. A guy that had come back from the dead. They were glad when they saw Jesus because you want to know why? Because now they realize that all their hope in him had not been in vain. That he was not a fake, he was not a fraud, that he was actually the Lord God come back. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you withhold the forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, just the same way Mary did. I love Thomas. Ready? I find myself in verse 25. I find myself. Everybody look at verse 25 if you have your Bible. I find myself in verse 25. That's what I love about Thomas. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails... And place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I love that. You want to know why? Because that's what I would say. I'd say something stupid like that. You know what I love about Thomas? He goes, you know, okay, cool. Okay, cool. No, I get it. All of us, we love Jesus. I get it, guys. We love Jesus. But here's the deal Jesus is dead. Dead, like dead, dead. Dead, gone, dead. All the rest of us need to get over it. He died. He's gone. We had a great three years with him. Now it's over, okay? Done. But all the other disciples who had actually seen Jesus, they go, no, we've actually seen him. And I love Thomas goes, you know what? If you guys want to have some like, oh, we saw Jesus. Good for you, but it's not going to be me. You want to have some group hallucination on some shrooms or whatever? Go for it. You want to live like in the past and have some like, oh, I think we saw Jesus. No. Because you want to know why? Because dead guys don't come back to life. You want to live in your little fantasy world? Okay. But it's not going to be me. I'm moving on with my life, guys. And then I love Thomas. He doesn't, he doesn't go, you know what? I'll consider that. I'll consider what Jesus. He goes, you want to know what? If Jesus, if I'm going to believe in Jesus, he better show up here. And not only that, if I think I'm tripping out on some 60s acid trip or whatever, I'm going to put my finger into the holes in his wrist and his hand, and I'm going to take my hand, and I'm going to put it inside of his rib cage, where, where the guard had stabbed Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. So he ran a spear up inside Jesus' rib cage and pierced his heart to make sure that Jesus was dead before they took him down. So Thomas, being a Jew of the first century, goes, I know what happens when people get crucified. They don't come down alive. So if I'm going to believe in Jesus, he better show up here so I can check it out. And now Thomas in the back of his mind is going, oh, right, like that's ever going to happen. Check this out. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Uh-oh. Although the doors were locked, they're still scared of dying. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, you know what I love about this? Jesus wasn't physically there when Thomas said this to the other disciples. But Jesus, because he's God, shows up and refers to this conversation. Imagine Jesus just shows up. Oh, Thomas, you're here. How convenient. 
deeper. Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Underline this next sentence. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And the Greek literally means there, stop your stupid disbelieving and believe. You don't believe anybody else's testimony about me? Then here I am, I showed up. Put your fingers here. Put your hand inside my rib cage. Because guys don't come alive off the cross, and they definitely don't die and come back to life unless I'm real. You don't feel the marks of ghosts. I'm really here. Believe. Stop disbelieving and believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Number one, number one in your notes, Jesus is really dead. And I want to make this point before we can talk about anything else is that Jesus really died. Jesus is really dead. For a long time beforehand, and at the height of his popularity, Jesus had prophesied he would die in Jerusalem. Eventually, in God's timing, Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and crucified. The Romans, who ruled Israel at this time, had perfected crucifixion, which they had adopted from the Persians before them. Now, we celebrated, or remembered, I should say, on Good Friday, the death of Jesus here in this room. And I walked everyone through what a crucifixion was. A crucifixion was specifically designed to torture you, to help you hang on for as long as you could until you died. And to give you the short version, if you were accused of something and found guilty by the Romans 2,000 years ago, they would strip you naked, they would tie you to a post publicly, like take you down to the promenade, they would tie you to a post, and they would whip you. Depending on how long they wanted to whip you, you could die actually on the post. Jesus was so close to death from being whipped and getting his beard tore out and being punched in the face that he wasn't even able to carry the piece of his cross outside the city. He had to have someone else help him. Once you got outside the city, they would take that cross piece, they would lay you in the dirt, still naked, and with your back and your legs all tore up, and they would pound a, a nail through your wrist because you have a hole in your wrist which allows your wrist to, to uh, twist. So it would not be here because your body weight cannot hold up. Uh, your body weight would actually tear through the nails if they actually ran it through your hand. So what they would do is they'd run it here through your wrist because it could hold your body weight and they would run a spike through your feet. And so Jesus hung for six hours in public naked um, on a cross. So the point that the Romans wanted to do is you don't mess with us or that happens to you. You want to be tough? Then that's what's going to happen to you. That's why the Romans did that. They wanted to scare people. They were truly the first century terrorists. And so, watch what happens. Jesus hangs on the, on the cross. For six hours, he finally dies. They're going to take him down. But before they take him down, they do one thing. A soldier takes a spear, about a six-foot spear, because you're hanging up here, and he goes up under your rib cage and pierces your, your rib cage into your heart to make sure there's no possible way you're alive. The reason for that is if you come down alive off the cross and you survive and happen to escape because like, oh, I'm dead, but I'm really not. Guess who goes up on the cross? The soldier that failed to do his job. So if you're a soldier in charge of the execution, you make sure he's dead because you don't want to go back up. And here's the reason I say that. is because Jesus was truly dead when he came down. Dead, dead. Dead, dead. There's no possible way. You, you hear like on the History Channel and A&E and stuff like, oh, Jesus kind of just passed out or he blah, blah. He didn't pass out. He didn't pass out. He passed away. Soldiers responsible uh, for carrying out a crucifixion made sure the condemned person was dead as anyone that happened to survive and escape was replaced with the offending officer. After Jesus was whipped, beaten, and tortured, he was nailed to a cross and hung there for six hours before he died. Before taking him down, a guard pierced his rib cage and heart to make sure he was dead. And I, and I, I want us to see this for sure, that there's no possible way 
in the first century that you would have come down off the cross alive if you were being charged with an executionable offense, which the, 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 the offense above Jesus' head was king of the Jews, which his official reason for dying was that he had rebelled against Rome. That was the official reason they put him to death. You don't come down from, from that. Okay, everybody with me? Dead, dead. Not sort of dead, not zombie walking dead, dead, dead. Number two, Jesus is really buried. Number one, Jesus is really dead. Number two, Jesus is really buried. And this is actually an aspect that we never even kind of consider, but I want you to think through this with me for a minute. After Joseph and Nicodemus had taken Jesus down from the cross, I want you to think about that. Not even Mary shows up to the cross. Not even Jesus' own family comes to get him. You want to know why? It's the same reason for the disciples that the disciples locked the door. Why? Because they were afraid that they were going to get associated with Jesus and get strung up themselves. But Nicodemus and Joseph, a different Joseph, not Joseph, the father of Jesus, actually take their lives into their own hands by claiming Jesus' body. After Joseph and Nicodemus had taken Jesus down from the cross, they washed his bloody body, wrapped him in linen, placed fragrant oils and spices on him, and laid him in a tomb. And so what would happen is once they took Jesus down off the cross, Joseph and Nicodemus take Jesus' body to a stone slab, much like our mortuaries, and they take, would take a sponge and cloths, and they would clean Jesus' body off. Once he was clean, they would, they would do a, a sort of mummification like uh, when they used to be slaves in Egypt, they would have learned this from the Egyptians. They would, they would have mummified Jesus, and they would have mummified him so tight that there's no possible way that even a healthy man could have gotten out of the, the, the bands, the bandages. And I say that for this reason. Remember when Lazarus came back from the dead? Those of you guys remember the story? What, Lazarus come, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is like, what's the one command that Jesus gives about Lazarus? Unbind him, or let set him loose. Not even a man who Jesus called back from the dead could get out of his bonds because they wrap you so tightly. Ladies, when you have a little baby and they have long fingernails and they start gouging themselves when they're infants, you know, when they're just born, what's the one thing that they do? They swaddle them, right? You wrap them so tight they can't get their hands out. Very similar to what the Jews would do with the dead bodies. And they do that for this reason. They keep everything together so as the body decomposes, everything stays there. They would also anoint the linen with oil and tuck fragrant spices inside of there so when they came to honor the dead, the stench would be somewhat palatable. And I say that for this reason, ready? No one expected Jesus to be alive. You don't wrap a guy up you think is going to come back in three days. You just stuff Jesus in a tomb and go, see you in three days, you're coming back. Nope. Jesus comes down dead, they wrap him dead, they clean him dead, they spice him up dead, they stuff him in a tomb dead, they roll the stone dead, they put a seal over it, he's dead. Mary comes back first day of the week. <sighs> Going to add some more spices to Jesus' decomposing body. Oh, Jesus is gone. No one expected him to be alive. Let's just be clear. Not even his own people expected him to be alive. Jesus is really buried. Upon seeing Jesus so savagely beaten, crucified, and stabbed with a spear, they rolled the stone in front of the tomb, never expecting Jesus to be physically alive again. And neither did anyone else. Because Jesus was buried on a Friday on, at sundown before the Jewish Passover, no Jews were allowed to do work or deal with dead bodies until sunup on Sunday. On Sunday morning, as Peter and John ran to find the stone rolled away with the official seal broken and no guards around, they marvel that the tomb is empty. And here's the point. If you're dead, you come off the cross, you're dead. If they wrap you up so tight, even a healthy man can't get himself out of the, of the bondages. And because the disciples were scared to even die, they're not going to venture to even try to steal Jesus' body because they're locked. They, want, they were so scared they were locking themselves in a room. So the only explanation is that Jesus himself had released himself because everybody that loved him had abandoned him. Number three, Jesus is really dead, Jesus is really buried, and Jesus is really alive. Jesus is really alive. There's no other explanation for why there's no body. 
because the Romans would have just kept them in there. The Jews would have kept them in there. And after three days, they just would have rolled the stone away and went, here's your, here's your dead Messiah, Jesus. Doesn't look like he worked out too well. There was no reason for the body to be gone. No one would have stole it, and no one would have presented it alive if Jesus wasn't alive himself. Jesus would have had to come back and be alive to be gone. There's no reason anyone would have messed with Jesus' body. Jesus is really alive. From Friday until Sunday morning, Jesus had laid in a tomb until he re-lifed himself, not in a resuscitated body, but a resurrected body. So many of us have been in the hospital. Um, we've gone under. Anybody gone under for surgery? Anesthesiologist comes in. I remember when I had my tonsils taken out. I don't know why, because my veins are pretty easy to find. But that lady stabbed me about 28 times trying to find. I'm like, my hand's not made out of Play-Doh, lady. Find the stinking vein. She's poking it like, uh, like she's playing a game or whatever. I can't quite find it. Do you feel that? Yeah, I feel it. I feel it. That's a needle going in my hand. So she finally stabs around until she finds it. I fall asleep. I wake back up. Tonsils are gone, can't speak, took a little while for me to get my voice back, right? Anybody that's gone into surgery, that's, that's a procedure in our day and age. Now, I didn't resurrect. I just, the anesthesiologist just gratefully brought me back from sleep. Could have not, but gratefully brought me back. For some of us that have been in car accidents and you've really literally died on the, on the table and they've had to jumpstart your heart to bring you literally back to life, you did not resurrect you did not get a different body. It's the same old body. Bummer for some of us, right? We're just like, thought I was coming back in the awesome body, but nope. I'm back to the same old one. That's, that's resuscitating, not resurrection. Jesus did not come back in his old beat up body. Jesus came back in his glorified, healthy body. The kind of body, watch, ready? If you don't like what you got right now, you're in luck because you're going to have an awesome body for eternity. One that, Wow. When, <laughs> someone's like, preach on, brother. Okay. When we looked at the end of 1 Corinthians, we saw the teaching about the resurrection. And the, a, a resurrected body is not the same one as you've got. You'll be the same in character. You have the same personality. You'll be the same person. But your body will never age. It'll never get fat. It'll never have to lose weight. It'll never die. It'll never get sick or have problems. You will have the ideal body that God built for you, designed for you from the beginning of time before sin. So I say that for this reason. When Jesus comes back from the dead, he doesn't resuscitate himself to his old mangled body. He comes back in his glorified, never dying body again. Because that's a resurrection. A resurrection means you come back different than you went out. Turn to, so you're in John 20. If you shut your Bible, shame on you. Turn back to John chapter 10. So turn back 10... 10 chapters in the same book, and I want to share you this amazing verse. This verse I'm going to read to you. Ready? Everybody with me? Everybody still with me? If one of your eyes is closing, poke it and bring it back to life, okay? Resuscitate it right now. Ready? I'm going to read you a verse that's going to separate Christianity from, from religion. If this verse that I'm going to read to you is true, Christianity is not a religion, but it's actually a relationship with God. If Christianity is a religion... Because when you're in your world religion class in college or whatever, you're in your cultural anthropology class and they talk about all these different world religions, you know, Buddhism, Taoism, whatever, what other isms and is there are out there, they always put Christianity with one of the world religions. And it's never a world religion. It is never a religion. Jesus, ne and I want to make this point. Ready? Buckle up. I want to make this point. Jesus never said Read my words or listen to my words and you'll be, you'll be saved. Jesus never said, just follow my teachings and you're good. That's religion. Here's a list of things to do and don't do. And I do my best. That's religion. Relationship is, though you screw up, I still love you. Though you fail, I still forgive you. Though I shouldn't even care about you, because we have a relationship, I still draw myself near you. Watch this. Watch how amazing this is. John 10, 18. Underline this. Words of Jesus. If this verse is true, 
Jesus is not a good man or a good prophet or a good teacher. He is actually the good God coming to flesh. Ready? Because this is something either insane people say or if it's true, God says. No one takes, who takes Jesus' life from him? The Romans or the Jews? Look at it right there. Who takes Jesus' life? Read your own Bible. No one takes my life. Who can say that? No one can say that. Because anybody could take my life, right? You could, I could, somebody on the other side of the world could come take my life. Who can say, no one takes my life? No one takes my life. That's insane to say that. Because anybody can take your life. Jesus says, no one takes my life. Really, Jesus? How is that even possible? No one takes it, my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I, I die when I choose to die. I have authority to lay it down. Here, get ready. Get ready, because it's going to get bumpy right here. Ready? I lay it down of my own accord in what? What's the next piece? And I have the what? Authority to do what? To take up my life again. Let me tell you something. You might be able to kill yourself and say, I'm going to end my life right now. But I can tell you this. When you're dead, you cannot relife yourself. And no one says, no one takes my life from me. Not you, not you, not you. No one takes my life. I choose when I die, and I choose when I relife myself. And that's something that only God can say if it's true. That's why Christianity is not religion. If that verse is true, that means you can trust Jesus with your eternal soul. Because that's different. That's either the voice of a crazy man or the voice of God. But if he backs it up with true coming back to life, then it's the voice of God in front of your face. Isn't that amazing? That's why you can trust Jesus with your soul. Not because he's a religion, not because he's a good guy, but because he can transform who you are because he transformed his actual self from a regular physical body into a resurrected body because he's God. That's a different way of thinking about Jesus. Everybody still with me? Got a little bumpy there. We still good? We still, okay, here we go. We're going to finish with this. Later on Sunday evening, when the disciples had gathered together to discuss their situation at dinner, <laughs> you ever been on a team that's failing? <laughs> like Kentucky or whatever? <laughs> I just wrecked some of your Sundays, right? Because now you're remembering your bracket pool or whatever at work. I just went in the toilet, right? Speaking of disappointment, some of you guys that put the hundy dollar bill in there or whatever, like, I'm going to make a million bucks off this. Kentucky all the way. Shaboom shaka. <laughs> Didn't even make it to the championship. You ever been on a team that's failed? At work, athletics, whatever. Maybe you're a lady that knits dog sweaters or whatever. And you're like, that's a cute dog sweater or whatever. You get, you get together in your little group and make things or whatever. You're like, somebody failed at, you know, made a three-leg dog sweater or whatever. You know, somebody in your group failed. Your group failed. It's funny when you're in a group because you can kind of get around and, and talk about it. Like, you know, if you're on a football team, you go, dude, you're the quarterback. Can you even throw a ball? You're the lineman. Can you block somebody? It's like a sieve coming through, man. I'm like, the minute I got the ball, I got a guy in my face. Like the receivers are like, hey, man, why don't you throw me the ball? Well, why don't you catch the ball? Do you have hands or No. If you've ever been on a team that's failing or failed, everybody gets together and they go, dude, what's going on with our team? That's exactly what the disciples did. You want to talk about the greatest failures in the world? They just followed a fraud for three years of their life. And now they're all together going, dude, are we the stupidest men in the world or what? We followed a guy that's dead. And we might die too. What a joke. What a joke we are. Can you believe it? We believe this junk. They're getting together, eating dinner together, going, there's not real reason for us to be together anymore, I guess. Maybe this will be our last dinner. Thomas is like, I'm out. If I don't see some real proof, I'm calling it good. I'm going back to fishing, working at Vons, whatever he was doing at that time. Later on Sunday evening, when the disciples had gathered together to discuss their situation at dinner, Jesus appears physically in the locked room. His first word to them is peace. After seeing him, touching him, and eating with him, they had peace in their hearts, which produced joy that their faith in him was not in vain. Even Thomas, 
who proclaimed he would not be fooled by wishful thinking or a group hallucination upon physically seeing and touching his wounds proclaimed, my Lord and my God. Miraculously, hope in Jesus would transform these 11 faithless Jewish men into bold proclaimers of life in Christ, ultimately giving hope to billions around the world. Life without hope isn't living. Let me close with this. Many of us have no hope this morning. We come here with failing marriages. We come here with failing parenting skills. We think about our kids and we just go, what happened to my sweet little youngster? Now raving, college car driving person? We come here with failing jobs, failing 401ks. We come here with not a lot of hope and not a lot of security. And I say this to you, watch. For those of us that have lived a little while, we've tried to do more and more. We've tried to fix and fix and fix. Oh, maybe if my sex life gets better, our marriage will be better. Oh, maybe if we just talk more, our marriage will be better. Oh, maybe if I just buy my kid this thing, he'll be happy or she'll be happy. Or if we just get a bigger house or nicer clothes or whatever. But you realize after you've lived about five minutes longer than that, is that you never get to the next thing. It's like the... One person's still awake. That's awesome. (laughs) And here's the point I want to make as we close our service. You never get to a point where you go, okay, cool, all the clothes are good. Okay, all my kids are good. Okay, now my house is big enough or nice enough or in the best neighborhood or my shoes or my coach purse is the, the best. You never get to that point where there's not another step to go. And because of that, there's never enough money in the bank. There's never enough good relationships that don't tank at some point. You never get there. To wherever there is, you never get there. It, there, there never gets got. Right? Those of us that are over like 23, right? You never get to God. And here's my point. If Jesus is really alive, if Jesus is really true, if Jesus is really here, to change people's lives, you can always have hope. You can always get there when it's God because God comes to you. You don't have to go to God. God already comes to you through Christ. He calls you to himself and says, are you done? Are you done? Because at some point, as adults, we have to say, okay, time out. I'm, I'm done with my war with God. I raise a white flag. It's over. I'm tired of, I'm tired of running after other things. Because Jesus, if you're real, if you're true, if what this Bible says about you is true, then my life can be transformed. Then I can have hope. Then my marriage can have hope. My finances can have hope because God will take care of me. Everybody see the difference? Watch. If Jesus doesn't come back, if it's a fraud, then you're on your own. I'll give you that. You're on your own. You gotta keep reaching out. You gotta keep trying. You gotta keep trying to get hope in things that have no hope. If Jesus is not real, you're on your own. I'm on my own. But if Jesus is real, there's real true power in Christ. There's real true living in Jesus. And if that's true, then your marriage can be salvaged. Then your kids can be parented. Then your life can be fulfilling because it's live for God, not for self. And that's a different way of thinking about Jesus and it's a different way of thinking about life. Some of us are not ready yet. Some of us are going to keep running the race and kind of going, I'm going to get there, 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 I'm going to get there. Are you getting there yet? No, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. You just never get there. Because it's deception of your own mind to think I'm going to get there, but you're not going to get there. But here's the beauty, is that way back here, God already was. And God is up here too with you. But my point is, is that all your life, It's not about performance. It's about God's great love for you. And that's something you can't buy. The greatness of Jesus can never be overestimated. Because he, watch, and I'm done, he is worth living and dying for if he is true. He really died, he was really buried, and now he's really alive. And if that is true, you can stake your life on him. You can set your marriage on him. 
You can set your parenting on him. You can set your finances on him. You can set everything in your life upon the rock of Christ because he's real, he's true, and he is alive.